I'd like to start with um, an acknowledgement. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands that we're meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, you're probably quite familiar with this now, but um, for you know people who might be joining who haven't uh, heard so much uh, about our programs, uh, here in ARDC, uh, the National Data Assets Initiative is our uh, our overarching initiative and it was set up to establish strategic partnerships with research communities and institutions and that was to develop portfolios of national scale data assets to support leading edge research and hopefully that that will lead to long-lived data assets that can be used to leverage existing research and administrative investment. Um, what we think about as underpinning this initiative is that uh, we can think of collections of data as being national research infrastructure because they support leading edge research and they're national in scale. The Australian Data Partnerships Program is one of five current programs currently running under this National Data Assets Initiative and it's our largest and most broadly focused and it aims to create or develop high quality data collections that support leading edge research and are national in scale. So, this program, we were thinking about data from multiple organisations, data that's consumed by uh, multiple consumers like researchers, policy makers and NGOs and governance arrangements over that data that include multiple organisations. Strategically, we wanted what we wanted to do here as AIDC was to support establishment and development of those assets where what was lacking was a force of competitive and uncoordinated where where the force was lacking um, that drives uh, this in the market. And so we wanted to step in and fill that gap um, and enable that emergence of those national scale data assets. So that's um, what we're trying to do here. Now, um, so what I had to remind you of, we've got um, uh, short presentations, a series of them here. We've got a little bit, the first half hour sort of assigned to doing that. Following those presentations, um, we're going to pause and have some discussion. Uh, what we're going to do is run um, something called Mentimeter after our presentations. And we've got Kerry here helping with that. Um, and she's that's going to help us focus on some of the issues that come out of that are common that come out of these presentations and across the projects, um, the things uh, that are problems or needs or gaps that are in common and we're just going to do a, a bit of a poll around that and hopefully have a little bit of discussion about some of those commonalities and then uh, we'll wrap it up. If uh, I'm going to keep a bit of an eye on the time, if you're running a bit over I'm going to um, try, I don't know if you can hear, ring my bell um, and if you hear a bell if you could just um, wrap up what you're saying and, and, and bring it to a close and then we can move on to our next speaker. All right, um, so we might move on to our first speaker and that's Michael Hall from the University of Queensland and he's going to talk to us about the Language Data Commons of Australia. Uh, over to you, Michael. Thank you. I um, also wanted to um, acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land from where I'm speaking, which is the Yagra and Durable peoples uh, near the Brisbane River um, and to uh, pay pay my respects and our respects um, on behalf of the whole um, project team uh, to the ancestors um, and, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. Um, so the project uh, about which I'm talking today is the Language Data Commons of Australia uh, Data Partnerships Project, we call it in full, um, to help us distinguish it from other bits of the broader um, LDECA uh, initiative that, that's underway. Um, so first I'd like to acknowledge all the, the partners, uh, collaborators in the project. Uh, we're working with uh, people in data collections and IATSIS, researchers at uh, Australian National University, uh, the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language, University of Melbourne, Monash University and Paradisic, and also University of Queensland, where I'm based. So I think I'm ready for the next slide. Um, so I guess, uh, the first thing that I always say is um, we often think of Australia as an English speaking country um, and well yes but no um, it's actually there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of languages spoken here um, and I hope 
through the establishment of the Language Data Commons of Australia that will help raise awareness amongst Australians that this is actually uh, a massively multilingual society um, in a really linguistically diverse region of the world. Um, and it's something we should be proud of, actually, and support. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so there's more than 300 different immigrant languages spoken in Australia. Uh, we consider English to be an immigrant language as well, um, in addition to hundreds of indigenous languages, uh, which are at varying states of um, kind of, uh, people talk about the health of the language. Um, so there's about 15 of them, which we consider to be really healthy languages. Um, and so part of the mission is about gathering this data together and making it accessible for communities uh, to work on uh, for reviving and revitalizing the languages. Um, Australia is also home to some of the world's oldest continuous cultures. Um, so it really isn't a young country at all, um, even though that's something we sometimes uh, think. Um, the thing about language data in Australia, there's actually been some really great work uh, among some of these partners, including Paradisic and Aniasis, uh, where they've actually started to build up uh, really excellent uh, collections following international best practice, but there's still a lot of collections which are underutilized uh, and even at risk as well. Um, so our mission is to start trying to build the infrastructure to bring these things together. Um, so what is our aim? So we talk about it being federated discovery and access to language data collections of high strategic importance for the Australian research community. Um, so one thing we try and make clear is it probably should be called the language data research infrastructure commons of Australia in a way, uh, because the data itself always belongs to particular institutions um, it's, we're not suggesting that we slurp all of this data up into some common kind of pool uh, where it's a, a free for all to access it. It's really about building that common structure, um, research infrastructure. So things like um, building a governance framework where it's shared, where we, we look after the infrastructure, um, but also how we access um, this uh, data. So there's a lot of uh, variation across different institutions and in how we do it. Um, and there's a lot of cross-learning, cross-pollinization uh, we think that can happen through uh, this community. We're also trying to build shared technical infrastructure. Uh, one of the things we mean by that is that the uh, underlying data structure is the same. And some of it involves uh, migrating it into a common data infrastructure. Uh, which aids when you're trying to build services to use that data across, uh, that helps with that. Um, we also want to build a, a portal uh, that starts to help discover the data. Um, so a good example of that would be if you're trying to work revive particular Indigenous language in the community, you might find there's um, uh, archival data, some of it might be held in IANSYS, some might be held in Paradisic, some of it might be held in university libraries, some of it might be in state libraries, some of it might be in Trove. It's really a big job to try and discover because you don't know what you don't know. Um, so it's about bringing that together. So I go to the last slide. So um, so our overall aim is, is really starting to lay the groundwork for a sustainable long-term repository. And uh, we like to, to talk about it being democratizing access, um, not only to researchers, but also to communities, because this is really important to everyone in Australia. Thanks. Thank you Thanks. very much for that, Michael. Um, now we'll move on to Tim. Um, from the University of Western Australia. It's going to talk about harnessing fish and shark image data. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, yeah, so thanks very much, everybody. Now, I'm actually joining you from a boat today, and I apologise for um, any noise you've got going on in the background. We're out here actively uh, collecting fish and shark imagery data for marine park reporting. We're actually out here in the middle of the Geograph uh, Marine Park. You want to go to the first slide? Thank you. Wonderful. 
So um, imagery is being used uh, increasingly around the around Australia and the world, and Australia is a global leader in collecting this imagery of fish and shark um, assemblages. And um, it's been shown to be really important for environmental reporting, the data that comes from this. Um, but there's a real need to increase the fairness of this data. And most of that is about really making it available, making it available for things like automation, automation projects that are out there uh, to automatically identify some of these fish and sharks, and also to make it available for environmental reporting at both local, national and global scales. Um, so one example of this is a current synthesis we've been working on with many partners around Australia of, of you know, 22,000 samples or so around Australia. And um, one of the really interesting things in this, that data set, and also in other data sets being collected around the world at the moment, is that the, the, the sampling methods are pretty standard and the annotation methods are pretty standard, but it's what happens to the data, the curation of the data that hasn't been standard. Next slide, please. So what we're proposing to do as part of this is to try and make a better place for all these data sets to be stored and, these, and to sort of improve the value of this data set to make it more reusable is to implement, you know, standard metadata and standard ways of referencing the data sets. And then as part of the work we're going to do with the current fish and shark uh, data community, make this available for initiatives like the annotation of uh, automated annotation of the imagery, make, make the data available as training data, uh, both the imagery and the existing annotations to sort of help those initiatives. And I saw Rod Connolly here before, which is he's exactly the person that I need to be working with and talking to but then also make them available, as I said, for, for, for summaries and syntheses. So we can go to the next slide, I think. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so already the work we've done so far has led to two um, papers put into publication for helping us to assess how um, our marine parks are doing around Australia. That's one in the top left about, about for assessing you know, state, territory and Commonwealth marine park performance, if you want to have that kind of a, 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 an idea. And we've also had some of the data sets submitted already towards the new State of the Environment Reporting report um, at the moment, and also recently uh, contributing to some global studies as well. Because as I mentioned, Australia uh, and into a certain part of New Zealand has been leading the way in developing these methods and they're now spreading around the globe and so in our work here with this fish and shark data part, data data um, program and also we're using the global archive uh, platform that we built uh, with previous ARDC funding we really think we can actually show people the you know a good workflow and a good way of how to look after these data sets and make them more readily available around the world, not just in Australia, and therefore give Australian researchers a great competitive advantage and get invited onto international grants and publications. <laughs> Thank you. That's everything from me. Thank you so much, Tim. It was a very authentic presentation, and I think Sorry. you won, a, won an award. For we stopped the we stopped the boat just so I could do this because otherwise oh. it was too noisy. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, now we're handing over to Nick Buckley from the University of Sydney. Um, Nick is going to be talking about the poisoning data set. Yep. So um, this is. Uh, Rose Cairns is the project lead on this, and I'm presenting it because Rose is um, off on maternity leave. Um, I think she got pregnant about the time the grants went in. Um, so we could go to the first slide, but basically this is about uh, a national poisoning data set. And many people, um, not sure why there's a blacked out region there, but many people um, don't, appreciate how um, a major cause of injury poisoning is. So it, it's uh, larger than the road toll and its effect on life expectancy and must be a cardiologist has blacked that out because that's showing that in fact it has the same effect on life expectancy as cardiovascular disease. Um, and there's been a big increase over the last decade that we don't really understand. And uh, our routine data collections done by, say, AI, AIHW, uh, use this coding system that actually doesn't tell you what any of the agents are that people have ingested. Um, and the poison centres provide a lot of coverage, so 200,000 calls a year take about poisonings where they're precisely recording lots of things. 
but this data has largely just been used for clinical purposes. So generating a data set that can be used very easily for research is trying to achieve with this initiative. Uh, next slide. Um, so we've got four different poison centres plus potentially some other sources of data on poisoning. And we need to harmonise all the different uh, data fields so that it's all comparable, it's all collated in one location. Um, there's been multiple databases in the past, so it's, it's not just the four databases, so we've got a whole lot of historical data to bring in. Um, data governance is a key issue for us because of privacy considerations around some fairly sensitive data around suicide, self-harm and drug abuse. Um, there's you know, many other things that need doing to make the data of good research quality. And we can jump forward to the impact. Um, and so uh, basically this kind of summarises the whole project. I hope people can, can read that. But basically there's a lot of data comes in from, so there's calls from the public, but there's calls from hospitals, there's calls from ambulance services. There's more calls about adverse drug reactions to the poison centre than there are to the Therapeutic Goods Administration. There are more calls about drugs in pregnancy than there are to most drugs in pregnancy markets. So all that data can be collected into a research data set and therefore, because it's this very, very big data set on a big problem, there's all sorts of people who we get interested in this. Uh, from those people who are interested in suicide prevention to product safety, to just uh, general injury surveillance, uh, to identifying drugs that are dangerous, to following initiatives to curb substance misuse, such as real-time prescription monitoring. Uh, everyone is interested in venomation. So I don't know whether you can pick up box jellyfish with your fish scanner, but you know, we could tell you if they, it, it matches up with when we get calls about them. Um, occupational health calls, again, there's a massive number of those, far more than are reported to occupational health agencies. And then we've got clinicians who are interested in improving poisoning management. That's my three minutes. Thank you, Nick. Um, we'll pass over to Rebecca Glowett from Telethon Kids to talk about the National Child Health and Development Atlas. Thanks, Catherine. Um, sorry, I'm a bit croaky. I'm just recovering from a cold. So if I start coughing, that's why. Um, so this project is called the Australian National Child Health and Development Atlas, or ANCHDA, which is a you know, really catchy uh, acronym. We're currently working on a bit of branding. Um, I haven't got everyone's um, logos on here because there are in excess of 25 partners. Um, so that's why we're kind of working on a bit of a branding um, project at the moment. Okay, next slide, thanks. Okay, so what is the problem? Well, we know that data on children and young people and families are held in a multitude of locations across the country. Um, government tend to work in silos and they collect their data in silos. However, in order to really um, look at the health and development and wellbeing of children, we need to put those data sets together to get a really good picture of how the children and young people in, West, in Australia are actually faring. Um, we can't make effective and efficient evidence-based decisions, programs, research on children and young people unless we actually have a really good picture of their health and wellbeing. Um, there's a number of groups across the country who have been working on bringing data together on children and young people and demonstrating it in a visual form. So basically geographically mapping data on children and young people um, for their sort of specific states or territories. And we thought, well, it's a perfect opportunity for us to actually bring everything together, bring all the partners together, look at what everyone has been working on and pick out the best parts so we can actually create a single portal or hub for visualising data on children and young people across the country. We really need an Australia-wide solution rather than state-based. So next slide, thanks, Catherine. So as I said, we've got people from across uh, across the country. Um, it's a fantastic group. Um, we've uh, we've been working. We're going to be working to curate um, the 
the data, um, look at what data is common across um, those groups and also what data is available that each group doesn't have individually. Um, and we're going to hopefully uh, visualize, have that visualized so geographically information, use GIS uh, technology to, to um, display that. So you can see this image here. This is what we've done in WA with the uh, West Australian Child Development Atlas. Um, so we want to do something similar, take the best parts of each different platform and bring them all together under a single banner. Um, next slide. Thank you. So look, we, we think that there's so such huge impact, potential potential impact for this project. It's actually really exciting. Um, you know, there's been a, a huge amount of excitement across the country actually since we got the grant. Um, there's been so many people working on um, trying to bring data together in different ways. And this partnership is is so strong and excited. So we you know we think that we've significantly increased the evidence base for decision making by having one single location um, where we can access a huge range of data. We can look at um, trends over time. So a lot of the data sets that people hold in government agencies go back 10, 20, 30 years. So you can look at changes over time. We can look at the impact of environmental factors. We can look at emerging trends and uh, monitor the impacts of things such as uh, COVID-19 across the country. And we can actually see you know, where things are going well in particular states or where they're not going so well and look at the impact of different policies and programs on children's outcomes. So that's it. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we'll hand over to Sebastian Manzini now at the University of Tasmania um, to talk about in situ wave observations. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Yep. So yeah, I will talk about the development of a national infrastructure for in situ wave observation. So you can go to the next slide. So um, wave data are critical to ocean industries, coastal development and leisure activities. But unfortunately, in Australia, the landscape for data collection and data delivery is quite fragmented. So that's why I put this uh, slide of a puzzle. So there's a lot of different um, organizations that are collecting data in Australia. So primarily, it's the state agencies, but also private industry. Uh, oil and gas, for example, they collect a lot of data around Australia. But also, more recently, IMOS, so the Integrated Marine Observing System, has started to also deploy web -board. Um, part of the problem is that there's a lack of, or oh, some of this data is publicly accessible, but a lot of it is not actually publicly accessible, so it's hard to get uh, an old on. Um, there's a lack of agreed data and metadata standards across the different groups that are collecting the data and publishing it, so make it harder for the user to really compile all the data together. There's really a lack of documented QA, QC, you know, um, practices across the different groups and there's a need from users for additional data product not just the, the usual time series of um, the wave height and the wave period but more in-depth product that you can derive data from it um, next slide so the solution is that sort of a summary diagram here um, we will build upon an infrastructure that we started building in 2018 from a, another project funded by ARDC. And so one of the main outcome really of a project would be to publish new data set collections. So we've engaged with additional partners in there to, um, to put new data into the system. So some of the coastal data collected by state agencies, data from the Victorian um, government that is really lacking at the moment, but they are deploying a lot of web buoy at the moment that we, we want the, their data in the system but also engaging with private industry and really trying to crack that to see if we can get data that is collected by oil and gas um, companies to try to see that it can be put together with the rest of the data. Um, the team will work on data standards, reaching out to international colleagues to see um, how can we define data and metadata standards we want to improve our workflow, so we're going to work with the Bureau of Meteorology to provide real-time data and a, a proper workflow to lower the bar of entry for new people to come and put their data into the system. Um, yeah, next slide, Sally. And so the impact is um, that wave data is required for many societal applications, so such as safety at sea and on the coast. 
understanding coastal erosion and for leisure activities such as surfing. Um, wave information is routinely identified as a primary requirement of blue economy um, industries and coastal manager, so it's really important. In the offshore industries, um, wave data are used for design, engineering requirements, and for operation at sea. Um, wave data is essential for calibration and validation of satellite instruments, especially in the last couple of years and in the future. There are many more satellite missions with more instruments on board that are going to collect data at a high resolution, and you need those in situ observation to calibrate it. It's also very important for calibration of wave um, wave model, especially in a local area where you have you, you want to look at coastal erosion, um, impact of inundation and erosion, and things like that. And finally, surface wave is has been identified by IPCC as a key driver for uh, coastal zone instability. It has a fundamental role in modifying exchange of heat, mass, and momentum across the air sea interface. So it's really key for climate application as well. Um, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thanks very much, Seb. Um, we'll move on now to our final speaker, Jessica from CSIRO, talking about a human mobility data asset. Hey. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me OK. I had to rejoin from my phone because my laptop decided to shut down. So can you hear me OK? That's good, Jess. We can hear Perfect. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I will give you a brief overview um, of the Mobility Australia project, which is a collaboration between the University of Melbourne, Queensland University of Technology, uh, the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network and the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. All right. So um, what is the problem? Uh, human mobility data is a key ingredient uh, to further research in many different areas of science. Um, and the current outbreak of COVID-19 is an example that has demonstrated uh, that humans spread infectious diseases really rapidly. Um, now, Australia lacks a comprehensive human mobility data set uh, that can be used uh, to model such diseases and how they spread and to ultimately prevent and control possible future outbreaks. Um, however, there's an abundance of high quality public data available um, reporting different aspects of human, human mobility. Uh, so a few examples are the number of international arrivals into Australia, uh, passenger volumes um, on domestic flights and information about the usage uh, of the Australian road network. Um, now, these data sets are collected by different organizations and government departments and are presented in various formats. Uh, so the data might be collected at different spatial and temporal scales and be presented in the form of, say, passenger counts or aggregated movement flows. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the, um, so this project addresses the challenge of transforming available mobility data into a consistent format uh, that is then suitable for analysis in a broad range of uh, research areas. So merging these various individual data sets into Australia's first comprehensive national scale human mobility data asset drastically improves the quality and coverage of existing data sets. And the, da uh, the final data asset will also be um, made publicly available and hosted uh, on the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network. Uh, users will then be available, uh, able to download origin destination movement flows at different spatial and temporal resolutions uh, through an API. Um, and then the next slide. Uh, so the final data asset has the uh, potential to create impact in various areas of science. Uh, such as epidemiology, policy and administration, and also transportation. Uh, for example, understanding the dynamics of human movement is paramount to understand disease spread and to ultimately contain outbreaks in a timely manner. Uh, in addition, human movement data can be utilized to evaluate the effectiveness of disease containment measures and inform new testing on containment protocols. Uh, another area where this project can create impact is transportation. Um, Australia's transportation sector forms the second largest source of carbon dioxide 
uh, emission. So to reduce Australia's carbon footprint, it is necessary to gain insight into how humans move across the continent and uh, availability of this comprehensive um, national scale mobility data asset that we will be creating will enable a detailed investigation of the impacts of human movement and can then in turn inform the planning of sustainable transport networks. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, that was terrific, actually, everyone. What a great diversity of projects. Um, we're doing really interesting things across a huge range of disciplines.